what we've been working on for the past two years. Uh, this past year has been crazy. There's a good reason that the word unprecedented has been used all the time. This is everything from governments changing to a global pandemic. And what the pandemic has really shown us is that digital spaces are really important and all the problems in digital space are well worth our time to address. This is everything from mis and disinformation to hateful rhetoric to all forms of undesirable content. These things really have important consequences in society. They can lead people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise have done based on false information. Efforts to mitigate all of these harms are incredibly important. But at the same time, we want to take a different tack. We want to think about what does it mean to create good or positive or thriving digital spaces? And what is a vision for what digital space could be? So that's kind of why we're here together today to zoom out and ask, you know, leaving aside what exists today, what do we want for our future digital life? What do we want for our kids' digital lives? for democracy. And we're gonna share some thoughts on this question based on a few years of research as a start, as a way into this conversation, but not as the definitive word. But what you'll hear today is a bit about how we approach this question, and then kind of this framework that emerged for thinking about what the qualities of public friendly spaces might be. And then some really interesting survey results about how super users all around the world evaluated existing platforms on these qualities. So you're probably wondering, why are we so focused on the good when there's so much bad that we need to address? And the truth of the matter is that we need both. Think of it in another context. Blood pressure medicine helps to keep us alive. And that's a really good thing. But that doesn't mean that we have a healthy heart. You have to exercise, you have to eat right. And it's the same thing in digital spaces. We do need efforts to try to mitigate some of these harms. But at the same time, we want to think about what are the qualities that make for successful, flourishing digital spaces. Before we get to the qualities, though, let's talk about why we keep using this word spaces to think about digital platforms. Our belief is that how we think about systems, how we conceive of them, has a lot to do with uh, what we do about them. And the metaphors that we use are really important. Research has shown that you know when people imagine crime, for example, as a wild beast, they endorse different policies than when it as a disease. Or, you know, when they think about national debt through the metaphor of household debt, then they start to get worried about things like foreign foreclosure on that debt, which is not something that can happen. Or, you know, when we talk about a marketplace of ideas, we kind of make two errors. One, that marketplaces necessarily promote the best products. And second, that speech fora work like marketplaces. So for the internet, one of our most uh, kind of dominant metaphors has been this one of people exchanging information and mediated by algorithms. And we might imagine, you know, sort of the people as nodes in a network, a graph, um, and they're sharing these packets of facts and ideas with each other. And there's a lot of value in this metaphor, obviously, um, you know, being able to abstract human systems and turn it into this kind of um, graph. But the danger is that we start to imagine uh, that what human beings primarily do with each other is exchange information. And even worse, that, they, that what we primarily do is sort of exchange and internalize facts. And this can lead, on the one hand, to this kind of overly rationalistic model of human society in which uh, you know, the, the, the question is just you know, sort of how do people internalize facts that they're seeing? Um, on the other hand, it, it leads to not thinking about all of the other stuff about human behavior, how we come together and act, all of the nonverbal things and the emotional things, and most importantly, kind of the nuanced thing that is human relationships. And so we wanted a better metaphor, and we started thinking about what are other metaphors for digital platforms? We thought about the body, maybe we could talk about healthy platforms or about large systems working together, but those weren't quite right. And we eventually settled upon spaces, and spaces open up a whole different way of thinking about things. They mean thinking about how people interact with one another, their nonverbal cues, their behaviors, the way that groups come together in these spaces. And this allowed us to start thinking about what does it mean to have an offline or physical space and how does that translate into a digital space and vice versa. And this unlocks all sorts of playful opportunities. So for example, take next door. Uh, this reminds me, if I think of the equivalent in physical space, of a community meeting in my neighborhood. 
where not everyone knows everyone else. You have someone that's ranting about how everyone's speeding. You have another person that says something vaguely inappropriate. The meeting goes on way too long because no one can get everyone under control. And you, you can think about it that way, but you can also envision then other sorts of experiences. So for instance, I think about the experience of when I'm in a park and my kids are running around with other people's kids and I'm chatting with other parents and we're talking about the world and we're learning about what's happening in our community and we're establishing these connections. And this can be a fruitful way to then think about how do we take those principles, that experience of being in a park and establishing these great connections and translate that then back into digital space. So the other thing about this space metaphor is for us, at least, you know, it was a source of real hope because it suggests that the things that are going on in digital life um, aren't necessarily all new problems that we need to solve. They're actually very old problems and in some ways as old as humanity. Um, and we have these disciplines that we can draw on. We have architecture and urban design and community building um, that have been around for centuries, sometimes millennia that um, can inform our answers to these questions. That's why you know, some of the paintings you'll see behind us are drawn from a film by William White. He was a colleague of Jane Jacobs in the 1970s. Um, and he was an acute observer on why some social spaces in New York City thrived while others weren't as uh, vital or, or, or relevant. And um, that work is as useful we think to the consideration of how to build better digital spaces as anything that's been published since the internet. So the other piece is we've really come to appreciate in the last 20 years, how much value these spaces have for society that public spaces are the places that knit people together, that they actually can save lives. Um, Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist has pointed out that neighborhoods that had more public spaces in a Chicago heat wave actually had lower death rates because people knew to call the guy who sat on the bench in front of the library and check in on him during the heat wave. So we need these spaces and uh, understanding how to build these qualities in digital life is really important. And let me just be clear, as we heard in the panel earlier, you know, that's not to say that we've solved all of the problems of physical public space. They're still incredibly complicated and contended and politicized kinds of uh, questions that emerge here. But it is to say that there's this wealth of wisdom that we can draw on and that we've done parts of this before, that we've made some of these same mistakes before, and that there's something that we can really learn from here. And we can take lessons from what we know about how to create good spaces in the physical world. So for instance, our first idea is to think not only about user-friendly design, but also to think about public-friendly design. Platforms are often designed thinking about user-friendly design. It's asking, how do you optimize things for an individual? But if you look at physical spaces, they're not designing for an individual. They're designing for groups. They're thinking about how people can interact with one another. And one person's desires may be different from another. And so it's actually sub-optimized for individuals, but optimized for groups. And this is exactly the sort of thing that we think platforms could draw upon when they're thinking about designing for the public. The second lesson we can take from physical space is actually tailoring these spaces for particular communities. Physical spaces often do this, where you're working with local residents to figure out what they'll use it for and why they would do it that, why they would want the space to be one particular way or another. Digital spaces, on the other hand, aren't normally designed this way. They're designed with the idea of reproducibility, with scale. So you often hear uh, discussions of how, how can we scale this? And we think that there's a lesson to be learned here from physical space about translating this idea of local, of working with residents to build something that really could apply to digital space. It's the same question as thinking about how would you want a space to be different for people interacting with a government representative, for example, than interacting with their friends. And we think that this is a really important question and lesson that we can learn from how physical space is designed. So the third lesson we can learn from public spaces is that there are these recurring attributes and design motifs that pop up again and again in successful public spaces. One example that I love is the curb cut, which is this little ramp that is cut out of the sidewalk so that uh, originally folks with in wheelchairs after World War II could make it more easily from the street to the curb. And what started in Michigan as a fairly, you know, small design intervention spread worldwide because it turned out that curb cuts also facilitated lots of other activity. They allowed parents with strollers to get around easier. 
They allowed bicyclers and skateboarders um, and folks who were pushing carts. And um, they made spaces a lot more accessible and a lot more inviting. So I think our research project is kind of asking this question of what are the qualities like accessibility that we want to have in digital public spaces so that then we can start to build the pattern library of design interventions like curb cuts that help us achieve those qualities. So in order to find the qualities of digital space, what we did is first we went to the literature in order to see what people had written about in the past. And here we looked at everything from philosophical texts about the great society or the great community all the way to popular writings for what makes a really thriving digital space. Next, what we did is we talked to experts from around the world, and this included political scientists and psychologists and sociologists and activists from diverse political viewpoints. Then we developed an initial set of signals, and we took these to users in five different countries and focus groups and asked them what they thought. This led us to revise the signals and add some new ones. And then finally, we fielded a survey in 20 different countries with over 20,000 people, letting us know what they thought about the signals and how the platforms were performing. So what we found was 14 kind of important qualities or what we're calling signals, and that they clustered in four groups, what we're calling four building blocks. And there's a lot more that we're sharing on our website right now at newpublic.org. We've got white papers that go into detail on the signals and more in-depth survey and methodology data and videos. But what we want to share with you right now is kind of the top lines of how these building blocks work together. Um, and then we'll get into some of the survey results about how platforms actually did. The first building block or set of signals is to make people feel welcome. And what we mean by this is that people need to feel safe in these spaces. They need to be inclusive, particularly for marginalized groups. And when we looked at our survey results and what we learned from the focus groups, this really was such a fundamental idea. It was a foundational set of signals that people needed to feel like they were comfortable in these spaces and that they could express themselves before they could get to any of the other signals that we'll get into here in the next few moments. Welcome is also particularly important when we're talking about tech because we're already in a non-face-to-face -face way. It's very easy for us to feel dehumanized when we're, when we're talking about uh, spaces that are virtual. So creating a space that's really welcoming is the first and most important building block that we uncover. So the second building block is connect. And, uh, you know, we've heard this word a lot when describing digital spaces. Um, but what we know from sociology and from lots of other fields is that, you know, building healthy communities isn't just about connecting everyone to everyone else, that it's actually about how we connect that's critically important. And uh, there are lots of examples of, you know, you can bring different groups into proximity with each other and they can increase trust of each other and respect for each other, or they can decrease trust or respect from each other. It's not just that they're in proximity, it's how that's mediated. It's what the structures are around these groups that really, that really shape um, how they come to see each other. And so some key elements of healthy connection include kind of feeling validated and a sense of belonging. And then also, you know, having these channels of connection to other groups. And that latter part is really important for equity concerns because um, we need these bridges for information to flow along like job opportunities, for example. If those can't propagate through a network, then you end up with some groups having more opportunities than others. Our next building block is understand. And we don't mean this simply as the exchange of information and bytes and algorithms. We mean it a little bit more deeply than that, by which I mean, we mean how do we grow and reach understanding together how do we work together to find out what's happening in our world and our communities? It's not only figuring out this reliable information, but it's also learning about each other and how people are different from us and what makes them different and how they, how they figure out their own viewpoint. Even more than this, it's figuring out how we can work together to improve our communities and improve the world. And this brings us to the final building block, which is ACT. And ACT, I think, is really important because when we talk to political scientists and sociologists, um, you know, they said, yes, connection is important, understanding is important, but um, there's something special that happens when groups of people do something together, when they build something together. And it kicks into motion this kind of positive flywheel where people act together, they trust each other more, and this reinforces their sense of community and their sense of willingness to participate and act. And so, uh, you know, it's not enough for public spaces just to facilitate um, that people understand and connect. Um, what's really great is helping people actually do something together 
as a community. So when we put this whole system together, all of these building blocks, here's what it might look like in space. And again, you know, there are a ton of details on the signals and how we're thinking about them, uh, what the survey says and our methodology on the website. But now let's talk about, you know, okay, we've got these building blocks, we've got the 14 signals. How did the platforms do? How did super users think that our current digital environments are faring in these qualities? In order to figure out how well the platforms did, the first thing we needed to do is make sure that we were set on our list of signals. And the list of 14 that we've called together, we think that this is a pretty good list. A lot of people told us that we captured the things that they think about when they look at these digital spaces. Granted, there's lots of room for improvement. And that's why we wanted to initiate this whole conversation and festival in the first place. But we think we've at least got a good starting point. So there's general agreement on what the signals are, or at least the starting point. But where there's lots of variation is how well the platforms are doing. And there's variation depending on what's the platform. And there's variation depending on who are the people. People evaluate these platforms differently depending on where they live and who they are. So to reach this conclusion, we did this survey across 20 countries. And we asked people about 15 popularly used platforms. The results really give us insight in terms of whether these platforms really are public friendly. What we'd like to do in the next few minutes here is give you just a little taste of what we learned. And there's a lot more information available on our website. When we talk about all of these results, we're really focused on what we're calling super users. And these are people who most frequently use particular social media, messaging apps, or search engines. And so we wanted to know what did super users think about how the platforms were performing on the signals. And the first really major takeaway is that there's lots of room for improvement. We asked people to tell us whether the platforms were performing well or were performing poorly with respect to these signals. And so we developed a measure that ranges from zero, which means that every single person said the platform was performing poorly, all the way to two, which means that every single person said the platform was performing well. And across all of the signals and all of the platforms that we evaluated, the highest score any platform got on any signal was for Reddit, and it got a 1.5. It received a 1.5 on the signal cultivate belonging. Surely we can do better than a 1.5 on one signal by one platform. There also were some signals where none of the platforms performed particularly well based on what super users said. And these include encouraging the humanization of others and really importantly, ensuring that people feel safe. And on LinkedIn, make power accessible is the fourth most highly ranked signal. Um, it's ranked a lot lower in other platforms, and it's rated above average by super users on this signal. LinkedIn super users also rank show reliable information as very important and award the platform an above average rating on that score. So fitting with this theme that no one platform can do it all, there are actually a lot of interesting insights for individual platforms. Let's start with Facebook. Super users of Facebook across the world rank the signals keep inf people's information secure and show reliable information as the most important signals for Facebook. But they gave the platform the worst ratings on these two signals. If we look at Reddit super users, they were unique because they ranked promote thoughtful conversation as the most important signal. None of the other super users on any of the other platforms did this. And they also thought that Reddit was doing a pretty good job. They also rate Reddit as doing a good job with respect to signals like feel connected and provide opportunities for different groups to interact. The survey also enabled us to look at differences by subgroups because it turns out that even though most of the time people rate the signals as similarly important and they give the platform similar ratings in terms of how they're performing, there are also really interesting differences if we look at people's demographics and their political attributes. So what we did is we looked at the five platforms for which we had the most data, and this included Facebook, YouTube, Google, Facebook Messenger, and WhatsApp. And when we looked at these, we tried to figure out, do people think differently about these platforms, depending on their political identity or depending on their demographic characteristics? When we looked at gender and age, there were differences about half of the time. In general, women and those who were older thought that these signals were more important. And they also rated the platforms as performing better with respect to these signals. Education was another really interesting thing to look at. So generally, you know, when we asked people how important the signals were, people with different educational backgrounds tended to feel pretty similarly. But when we asked people about performance, the educational backgrounds mattered more. So in those cases, people with lower levels of educational attainment generally thought that the platforms were doing a better job than people with higher levels. 
And one big question when we got into this was thinking about those with different political affiliations. So were there differences between those on the political left and those on the political right? Now, this is an international survey. So what left and right mean really varies depending on where you are. But overall, when we look at this, there were some interesting patterns. About half of the time, those on the right believed that the signals were not as important compared to those on the left. And they also thought the platforms were doing a better job than those on the left. Now, there were exceptions to this, and the exceptions are really interesting. So for example, for WhatsApp, those on the political right, in fact, said that several of the signals were more important than those on the political left. And if we look at how people evaluated the platform's performance, super users on Facebook and YouTube they were actually more likely to say that the platforms were doing poorly. Those on the political right were more likely to say that the platforms were doing poorly on the signal of giving everyone a chance to share their views regardless of their background compared to those on the political left. These demographic and platform differences really drive home the point that no one platform can do it all. Overall, across all of these findings, what we really hope that we're doing right now is starting a conversation. We think we have a starting point for thinking about the signals. But this is an opportunity for all of us to work together to think about what is it that we envision for a good quality, thriving, flourishing digital space. We need to figure out how we evaluate existing platforms and using public opinion like we've done in this point is just one of many mechanisms that we might use to figure out if the platforms are performing well. It's also important that we think about how these signals could inspire new and existing platforms to design differently. And we want this to be a collaborative conversation, which is why we have the festival in the first place. So we can all come together and think about what is it that we want to do to create digital spaces that really rise to the level of meeting these signals and working as flourishing spaces. So in conclusion, we think it's time for a bolder public imagination for the internet. We think figuring out this question of how to build equitable and constructive and public friendly digital spaces, spaces that do the same things that parks and libraries do in physical life is like a critical mission for the 21st century. And it may feel kind of impossible, you know, especially if you're an American like me, we're accustomed as a culture to looking to our grand future visions, uh, looking to, to entrepreneurs for our grand visions for the future. But there is this incredibly inspiring history of public innovation as well that we can look to. You know, the people who created public parks and gardens and high school and libraries. And these were institutions that citizens decided, you know, we needed to stand up because there were critical gaps missing in our communities. And I think that's why we're here together today to, to find the imagination and the vision and the community and the connectedness that can make this happen. The depth of dysfunction in our society and in our technology can really feel overwhelming a lot of times. But I think when we zoom out, we can see that human societies have encountered these problems many times before, and we can take heart in the fact that we've overcome challenges of coordination and communication and community building many times before. In the end, the hope is in each other. Thank you. <laughs>